morning to all the audience on site and to the audience online as well. Uh, welcome to our session from Ways to Wardrobe, Making Circular Fashion Fashionable. I'm Li Xing from Taixing. And today, there's a very interesting topic, but I want to give you a little bit of background. The fashion industry accounts for 10% of annual global carbon emissions and is responsible for an estimated 20% of industrial water uh, wastewater pollution worldwide, and 85% of all textile going to dump each year. If that number sounds too abstract, just think about one T-shirt that you like to wear most. And that <coughs> T-shirt, to produce that, it might be taking about 20, well, 2,700 liters of water just to produce one T-shirt. And the, in in the industry's huge environmental footprint really requires a systematic rethinking how much we should produce, how much we actually need to consume. And it takes a sea change of global consumption habit and a lot of innovations as well. And with that, we have a distinguished panel today, this morning, to discuss how fashion can transform to design out of waste. Let me quickly introduce our panelists today, sitting on my Left-hand side is uh, Suchicha Lohia, Deputy Group CEO of Indorama Ventures. And the gentleman in the middle is Paris Louvet, uh, CEO of Ralph Lauren. And I'm not asking him what jacket he's wearing, the what brand <laughs> of the jacket he's wearing. <laughs> and uh, Leslie Johnson, CEO of Laudes Foundation. And Margaret Chang, Editor-in-Chief of Vogue China. That explains the very bright hair style. Um, so let me start quickly with uh, Suchicha. Indorama Ventures, headquartered in Thailand, is the world's leading PET producer and one of the largest producer of PET resins and polyester uh, fiber as well. So you certainly can play a very significant role in ensuring textile durability. What are some of the key opportunities and challenges you encounter in shifting towards reducing textile waste? Good morning, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. To set the context to your question, Jen, we need to recognize that polyester fiber today is relevant in the entire textile industry in the fashion world, it plays a dominant part both in apparel and home. It's because of its technical durability and performance. As we advanced in scale, it's become a more economical fiber in the world as compared to its conservative alternatives. It has provided job opportunities growth throughout the world. In the context of climate, research has shown that it has a lower carbon footprint, a life cycle, be it production, use or disposal. But we can and we should do more. As we approach towards textile circularity, it is imperative that we reduce the use of resources, imperative that we reduce the use of virgin fossil fuel. I believe companies like Adidas and others have replaced a large content of their virgin polyester with recycled PET fiber and are going to do more and more. But today's recycled fiber comes from PET bottles. And what we believe is bottle-to-bottle -bottle recycling actually keeps the material in circulation for a much longer period of time. Whereas once bottle turns to textile, it is end of life and we treat it as textile waste. So here, fiber-to-fiber -fiber recycling is extremely crucial as we approach circularity. To remain relevant in future, the textile industry, the fashion world, needs to have new technologies to aim at this very problem. The linear, circuit, the real linear production approach, shifting to a textile circular approach, needs to bring in four important parts of the ecosystem into play, into maturity, into scalability. I cannot emphasize the importance of collection, 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 sorting, reuse, and recycle. The Rehab's Europe initiative has been set up to address this very challenge. And Indorama is happy to be a very proud partner of the same. Today, as you mentioned, we, the world recycles only 2.5 million tons. No, sorry. The world require, uh, recycles only less than 1% of textile waste. The Rehab's Europe Initiative has set a target by 2030 of 2.5 million tons. So fiber to fiber recycling, in my opinion, is the answer to reduction of polyester waste. 
Interesting. Thanks for sharing uh, some of the uh, points that you talked about, the scalability and how to make that economy viable, especially what kind of policy can facilitate that. We'll come back to some of these topics again. But let me move on to Patrice. Um, Ralph Lauren announced its Leave On Promise uh, in mid-2022 and promised to create clothes that last and can be reused many times over. Tell me more about it. And also, what are the principles and to reach the goals that you uh, uh, pledge to do the circular principles of 2025? Good morning, Shin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for having me as part of this panel. So, um, you know, if you kind of summarize Ralph Lauren into three words, we're about quality, we're about authenticity, and we're about timelessness. And if Ralph were here, he would say, I want people who buy our products to wear them today, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, right? So timelessness is really at the very heart of what we stand for. And timelessness requires future-proofing your business and obviously requires circularity. Now, there's been a lot of conversation in the industry on elements of circularity and clearly the there's a massive opportunity for this industry to move from, to exactly to your point, Shitra, from a linear approach to a fully circular approach. And there's a lot of discussion around recycling. We really believe you have to step back and look at the entire system. And this requires actually a, a system redesign, right? That goes from how or design teams design products to the types of materials that are being used to the processors, to your point on collection and, and recyclability, to also just how do we leverage scale. It's very clear that not one company is going to be able to change the landscape. And the numbers you quoted are, are quite significant. We're going to need to come together in order to move the needle. So a couple of examples on, on these four elements. On the design front, our teams, for example, now ask themselves the question, our design teams ask themselves the question as they put products together, okay, how is this going to get deconstructed? How is this going to get recycled over time? So what kind of buttons should I use? What kind of trims should I use? Of course, what kind of materials should I use? That conversation didn't happen four or five years ago. There's a lot of work on materials. We'll probably get a chance to talk about it uh, later. And, and you mentioned a, a few of the things that are, that are underway. But I think being very diligent on the type of materials that our designers use now and saying this, this is a portfolio of options, this is no longer feasible and, and something to look into. From a processor standpoint, uh, for example, we've, we've just developed a cashmere sweater, which is cradle-to-cradle -to -cradle certified. So thank you, Bill McDonough for everything that he's created there. Um, and we're working with a processor called Reverso, which actually is going to enable us to take this used cashmere, once people uh, are ready to give it up, having worn it for multiple times, and then transform it. But we have to build this processor capability. And then finally, scale. Right? Um, we are in a very competitive industry. Right? And every company that plays in this industry likes to win, including Ralph Lauren. Uh, at the same time, it's very clear that, as I mentioned earlier, one company is not going to be able to solve it. The parallel for me, if you bear with me, is uh, airline safety. Right? Safety belts on airplanes, the, the airline companies are not competing on who has the best safety belt. Right? The idea is we need great safety belts for everybody. I think the same philosophy needs to apply for our industry, which is how do we come together to develop the best solution that are relevant across the board, and then we can compete on other elements of the business model. So uh, we are part of the Fashion Pact, which was created actually uh, four or five years ago, really with the intent of bringing multiple players in the industry with scale to drive change. The global fashion agenda, fashion for good. I mean, there are a lot of really critical organizations that can help scale all these efforts and, and really transform the industry because we're very clear that this is an expectation from our consumers, this is an expectation from our employees, this is an expectation from our wholesale partners, and obviously the regulatory work world is moving very quickly here. Like you said, it's, um, it takes the entire effort of the whole industry. And uh, I want to turn to Leslie. The Loud Foundation, Loudest Foundation is young, launched in 2020 by the founding partner of Fashion for Good, which Patrice just mentioned. Tell us about this, uh, your foundation, and tell us about the initiative as well, and which areas you find that systemic action is needed and can be achieved. 
Sure, great. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. And I'm going to pull on some of the things you said, because you mentioned two things, Bill McDonald and collaboration. And that's really kind of the core of what we're doing. So I'm the CEO of Loudus Foundation, which is a private foundation really trying to accelerate change across multiple industries, including fashion. And as you know, and as you rightly said in the beginning, fashion is a very broken industry. The take-make-waste linear approach uh, is not serving people or planet. And what we did about, uh, I guess, about seven years ago, we were very inspired by Bill McDonald, <coughs> who actually challenged the shareholders of CNA, the company in the same group we're part of, to fashion endlessly. And what if you could think about the fashion industry as actually not being constrained by materials, completely circular, where people can thrive, what does that look like? And that thinking about what does it mean to fashion endlessly got us to think, well, what's missing? And what's missing is that second thing you said, which is collaboration. You need innovation to change business as usual, but you can't do that without collaborating. And what that effectively means is you need to take innovation, which is at the heart of fashion. I mean, think about the newest shoe made from you know, plastic bottles. That's you know, competitive DNA and bringing it into the pre-competitive -com pre space. And that's the core of fashion for good. It launched in 2017. It's actually based in Amsterdam, but it's global. And the core of fashion for good is, well, the secret sauce, I think, is the orchestration between market, innovators, suppliers, and consumers. And over the past six years, it's worked with 25 corporate partners. It's unlocked about 1.9 billion in new investment in their innovators. It's worked with about 175 innovators. And more importantly, it's run about 400 orchestration pilots in the supply chains of its corporate partners. And that is phenomenal, because that's the first time I've seen, and I know that Ralph Lauren's doing that through its alliances, Corporate partners coming together, sitting around the table, talking about best practice in you know, non-animal leathers. I mean, that's just unheard of, because that's really been kind of a competitive thing. So we've really opened that up. I'm really excited for where it's going to go. And I think the next stage of Fashion for Good is to double down, to double down on those innovations that will address carbon, water, and waste. That's really, you know, that hard tech is really hard to scale. So that scaling is a priority but also the supply chain is a priority. We started with brands and innovators, but we need to bring manufacturers and suppliers in as well to step up. Exciting. Manufacturers and the brands is only, the industry is only half of the story. The mm. other half is the consumers. That's where I want to bring Margaret. Well, tell us about the consumer, what the consumer have in mind when they see the garments made of recycled materials and coming from China, what's the uh, mentality in Chinese? Oh among the Chinese consumers and all that? I think something to zoom out on and it's really important to remember <coughs> is that creative culture and the power of storytelling is often underestimated in the broader sustainability conversation, not just in fashion, but more generally speaking. We have a very close partnership with the UN SDGs, particularly on goal number 17. And we talk about that a lot of, you know, we can do all this kind of infrastructural systems change, uh, supply chain change in the background, but at the end of the day, how do you emotionally uh, connect that with the audience? Because our consumer is, you know, they're human beings at the end of the day, and they have certain drivers that make them tick, they have value systems that make them behave in certain ways, and if you only focus on the fact of a circular economy, what does that mean to them in their daily lives? If you focus only on the fact of recycled materials, even if it's labeled on a tag, it's on an Instagram post, it's on a press release, what does that actually mean to them in the way that they want to cast their vote as a consumer with their purchases? And so it's less about these are the things that we're doing and consumers should accept it. It's about what are they actually protecting, right? What is the environment that we're actually protecting? What is the storytelling and environmental protection context around that? What are the consequences if we don't take actions like this? And if they're choosing between a product that has recycled materials or has um, a corrected supply chain versus something that does not, what is the impact of their decision? So, that doesn't come in a split-second decision at the point of sale. That kind of storytelling needs to happen so much earlier to lay those foundations, not in a condescending mm -hmm. way of education, but more so giving them the, the knowledge, empowering them with the knowledge to then give context to their purchase. And it's not that they're necessarily activists in every purchase that they make, because that's also an unrealistic way to look at human beings. <laughs> 
particularly in a space like fashion where fashion and lifestyle and creative culture is a source of joy and escapism a lot of the time. It is beautiful. It is something that people look to to be a part of a tribe or a community that is interest-based. And so something that Patrice said that really resonated with, with me as well is that the circular economy conversation is not in isolation. It needs to be paired with this um, conversation around consumer psychology and the value they place on things. Because if the system, as Patrice said, is designed not currently to win in the sustainability place rather than in the process of trying to win in a sustainability space relative to our other partners in the space, but not to lose in the traditional capitalist model, right? Then the consumer is always going to look at things as buy and dispose, buy and dispose. If we continue to train consumers in this psychology, then it will just continue to work against a lot of the back-end hard work that we're doing. So there's that greater conversation of, okay, as brands, as media, as individual voices, what are the trusted voices that the consumers are really influenced by and how does that work in tandem with the rest of the industry? And so much of it is about systems change because at the moment what we're doing is kind of mitigating for a lot of the errors that we've realized that we've made, as opposed to really designing new system with the purpose of that overall sustainability message and environmental protection. So I think as far as the Chinese audience as well, I think because of their ecosystem, it's they have a lot more literacy around you know, what the, um, their options are as far as sustainability. It is a lot more integrated because of the rapid development of their ecosystem, and they're much more adaptable in that way. But the question for them is always, why? You know, why do I need to care? And they're looking for people to provide those answers. Is there age difference among literacy of the different, uh, the consumer habit change? Yeah, absolutely. I think younger generations, I, I wouldn't put a blanket kind of approach on demographics of, you know, age differential on 25 to 35 or anything like that, because city to city, first tier, second tier, or interest community to interest community, there's a lot of different messaging around lifestyle products versus auto versus fashion, for instance. But I think there is a general sense that the system as it stands doesn't necessarily work. There's a lot of awareness, especially in um, youth in China born after 2000, that the psychology of product, of this constant attention economy of buy, 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 or look at me and look at me, that's not necessarily sustainable for them personally as far as energy, but also for the greater environment. So they're looking for answers and they're often not getting them for the greater context. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to partner with our industry partners. I believe those are the trends that the industry has captured or has been trying very hard to understand and observe as well. A lot of interesting points come out from the first round of discussion, but I will pick some of the uh, 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 parts and uh, zoom in. Let me start with the material uh, from you, uh, Patrice, that uh, you just mentioned your uh, recycled uh, fabric. So tell us more about the recycled fabric and what kind of industry standard that you should bring to expand that, just not, not just the Ralph Lauren practice, but more of the industry practice. So materials innovation, absolutely, absolutely critical. Uh, we've made commitments that by the, by the end of next year, 100% of our materials will be sustainably sourced. We're at 89% right now. We also made a commitment that by the end of the next year, we will be selling high quality products that include 100% recycled cotton. The two examples I'd highlight. Um, the first one is an investment we made in a company called Natural Fiber Welding. So they actually take used cotton, because the big question mark is what do you do with used cotton? Right? We talk about recycled uh, plastics, and we actually did a polo shirt a few years back out of recycled plastic bottles. Um, but obviously we've got to address the used cotton issue. And this company takes used cotton and through their technology is able to recycle it in a way that you now get fabrics that have the characteristics of the best polyester elements from a breathability, flexibility standpoint, but an, an incredible consumer experience and, customer, and consumer feel. We launched at the Australian Open actually a year ago, uh, a polo shirt, which is our, one of our iconic products, with the Claris technology, and have seen very strong consumer response. Now, the opportunity and the challenge for us is how do we scale that up? But that's very promising, right? Because now there is, an, there is a technological answer to how do you deal with used cotton? Um, the second one is regenerative agriculture, all right? Because as, as we keep, exactly to Margaret's point, kind of this, this cycle of, of innovation and what's new and I gotta buy something different, 
we're exhausting the earth. And it's very clear that we're at a stage now where we can no longer just keep taking and keep taking and keep taking, right? We now need to do a much better job using existing resources and reusing them. So in that context, through our foundation, we've actually established what we call the U.S. Cotton Regenerative Fund, which is designed to help farmers, we're starting in the U.S., pivot to regenerative practices. Uh, we are scaling this up. This is not a, only a Ralph Lauren effort, although we are the tip of the spear on it. Other companies have joined us. We now have impact in six different states. We've touched a million acres. And I think we're, this whole regenerative concept, which you've seen across uh, a number of different areas, I think is, is a big part of the answer of this not exhausting the resources of the earth, but kind of constantly recreating it. Now, similar to the earlier conversation we were having, Scale is going to be critical here to make a difference and investments. These, these things require uh, investments. But, but we're excited about it. We're approaching it with a, a real sense of urgency and uh, a lot of positive energy. Mm. And, and just to build on Margaret's earlier point and her platform, which is an amazing partner, has an incredible role to play in educating consumers in all of this. Because we, you know, we come out with explanations for are uh, circular solutions, but they're complicated. And we need to find ways to really do this in a, in a way that resonates simply, how do we capture that in a simple statement and a simple visual? And I think that's work that we, the industry, along with our media partners, need to do a, continue to do a better job on. Is it cheaper for them to buy the more environmentally recycled fabric made product? So broadly today, no. Uh, although I know we were talking earlier today, there, there are situations where actually, I do believe though, that this will be better and cheaper. So I think over time, because at the end of the day, we need to create value for all of our share stakeholders. Uh, I do believe over time, as, as we build scale behind these efforts, we will end up in a better position from a cost standpoint. So not only will we have better solutions for the planet, but we'll also be in a better position to create value. Something we were talking about earlier was also around the fact that recycled materials don't stand in isolation, right? So an adjustment in a certain part of the supply chain will have ripple effects throughout the supply chain. And so an example we're talking about were independent Chinese designers who are coming up at the moment, and they do actually find that it's cheaper for them to produce with more sustainable materials and in a more sustainable way throughout the whole supply chain. Even if one isolated material might cost slightly more than a traditional choice they might have, but in the context of you know import-export or machinery or all of the flow and effects that come from a certain material choice, <coughs> Does net out better for them as an independent brand. So that can be achieved. Yeah. And uh, come to uh, uh, Suchicha. So, as a material supplier, what are the challenges you are facing and do you buying? Um, well, Patrick says we will we'll, we'll get to that goal. How many years do you think you are looking at? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me share with you first that we are proud today to announce that. Till date, we have recycled 100 billion bottles of PET plastic. And the target is by 2025 onwards to target 50 billion bottles annually. But we have immense challenges in the industry. And one of the biggest challenges we see is, to your point, educating the consumer. You need to see PET as a resource and not as a waste. So there has to be responsible disposal of the water, bottles rather than littering them on the streets so that they can be collected and put it back into the recycling stream. The other thing that we see is the infrastructure which is lacking for collection. And you couldn't emphasize more on the collaborative effort throughout the supply chain that we require to bring this to fruition. <clears throat> textile to textile recycling we've mentioned, and Indorama is in the forefront of investing in technologies for fiber to fiber recycling. We are in the process of working with Carbios, which is a unique enzymatic solution to break down polyester to the monomer level and potential to scale to an industry level. So hopefully that will work for the fashion world. The other one technology partner that we partnered with is Polymateria, which breaks down certain plastics and makes them biodegradable. So these are certain investments that we have made in the technology phase, and we continue to do so. We, com we remain committed to do so. We see recycling and reducing the waste in the world as an opportunity to improve our own production process. Uh, reduce the use of water, treat water, reduce our carbon efficiency. 
So we are all committed because we think recycling is the holy grail to going to a more circular economy. Durability of textiles, which you've mentioned, is very, very important, and I think it starts right from the design phase. What is happening today is a lot of the secondhand goods, you know better than me, is going to places like Kenya and Ghana, where it is repaired and then resold. But if you don't have the durability, the bales that we provide them cannot be repaired and cannot be resold and end up as landfill waste. We call that waste colonialism. We need to prevent that. So these are some of the challenges that we see the industry is facing. Fascinating. And since you mentioned about the second-hand clothing exporting to developing countries, that's another issue on the social and social impact dimension that I want to bring us on. So Leslie, what's your comment on that? And especially if you exporting so many second-hand clothing to developing countries, what kind of impact and implication that has to the local effort to build their own domestic textile industry and job creation as well? Yeah, thanks for the question. This is the big doozy. Um, so I think maybe just taking a step back because that question assumes an element of the fashion industry that we are all trying to eliminate, which is waste. Because the reason why there is this export is that there's excessive waste. You gave the stats in the beginning. We know we only wear 20% that's in our wardrobes. What is it? A truck of textiles goes to landfill every second. You know, we know the stats. It's bad. So that's the current situation. So rather than try to build local industry and counter that, what we're trying to do is counter the waste problem at source, which is done with innovation, as I said, which is done through more creative um, uh, business models. Um, at the same time, we realize there is a lot of waste coming in. And as a foundation, we've been supporting initiatives to you know, try to support the waste pickers and try to get some of the, the materials that could serve as feedstocks um, to go into your supply chain, <laughs> possibly, um, and other models like that. So at the end of the day, and we haven't actually mentioned people, I think you touched on it with your regenerative agriculture, people are critical to making the circular economy in fashion work. Um, and maybe just as an aside, because I think it's quite funny yet terrifying, about 12 years ago, I went to a business conference where the topic was putting people at the center of circularity. And it was all about how do you get consumers to bring their goods back to put in the bins at the stores so you can recycle them. Nothing about workers, nothing about producers, nothing about the people in these countries that are trying to get jobs when this waste is flowing into the country. And that's what we need to think about. We need to think about what is the impact of all this material innovation on the garment workers, on the producers, and that sort of thing. And it can be a positive impact. It can be a positive impact if we understand how it impacts them. We help them maybe retrain if automation means that there's fewer jobs in Bangladesh. Um, it could be a positive impact if they're part of the solution. And so we do with them as opposed to to them. Um, but right now, I think our model in the industry is such that you know, material innovation is the driver. Um, but we need to flip that and actually put people at the center, including in these countries where the waste is flowing in. If I can reinforce Leslie's point, I think your, your point on we've got to reduce waste up front is critical. There's too much excess in this industry. Yes, yes. Not just what consumers buy, but just what we produce and supply well exceeds demand. Yeah, absolutely. And, and all of us companies need to do a better job matching supply to demand mm -hmm. because that'll help address the waste mm -hmm. issue from the get-go. Absolutely, and help consumers understand that they don't need 20 pairs of shoes. Well, I think that's something to kind of zero in on as well because it's very easy for us all to sit here at Davos as executives <laughs> and you know, leaders in our respective organizations and talk about consumers. And I think something really important is to not underestimate the consumer either, right? It's like we don't need to dumb down the information. We need to meet them where they are. And I think what you say about people is super important because it's one thing to produce all of these things and try and change systems and then after the fact try and message to the consumer, oh, you should care about this and you should feel bad if you don't care about it. It's about actually identifying in different parts of the world where the consumers are, regardless of demographic, what are the people-centric cultures that already exist that we can then participate in and bring our storytelling to with regards to these products or sustainability tourist storytelling. I think I speak more specifically to China and prospectively the Eastern Hemisphere um, when I gave some examples of the initiatives that we've done at Vogue, but um, there are already existing independent Chinese designers or independent designers in the East where their principles or their 
from the beginning of starting their business, they already have these kind of waste mitigating or waste free practices. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that need to champion rather than creating a whole new construct, adding a whole new level of messaging when everyone's already bombarded with information. Or even traditional crafts, right? Traditional practices that in China have been there for thousands of years. There's hundreds of traditional crafts. They, by definition, are waste-free in the way that they practice. And there are so many cultures around the world that have these traditional crafts that, by the way, are dying. And that social sustainability element, if you can connect that with the waste-free or circular economy uh, sustainability, sustainability element, if you're championing those, constructing systems where you can have those become a part of local supply chains with the brands, with the local creators, and feed into creative culture in a way that already exists. It's like a lot of the conversation this week as Davos has been at Davos has been about <laughs> sustainability, AI, rather than looking for synthetic or synthesizing new solutions for things when there are already solutions existing in the ecosystem, whether that's in nature or in people ecosystems, I think that's such an important element of adaptation <coughs> to local markets of messaging. And especially how do you make this messaging effective in the emerging markets that you have massive millions and millions of people yeah. just entering the middle class and the enjoying the, the first time they can afford mm -hmm. buying those many things, how to tell them the message. Anyone want to comment on that? Well, I think to Margaret's point, we have to weave it into our, our core communication. It can't be a parallel path. And for us, it's a, it's, it's a corollary to our quality message, mm -hmm. right? Which is really explained, because it, as I mentioned at the outset, it is a core element of our, our brand positioning is Sustainability is a reason to support and to believe the, the quality promise that we make to our, to our consumers. But um, I think Margaret's point on how do you leverage existing platforms, how do you ex leverage existing practices, that makes, that makes a lot of sense and we all, we all need to do a better job there. I think it's also a matter of understanding the audience first. Right, if you're able to understand what tea they drink in the morning, what excites them, what their goals are, and what they're aspiring to, then you're better able to communicate with them as far as, or like bring them on the journey with you as opposed to do all the work behind closed doors and then assume that they'll come with you when you get to the point of sale. I think it's very important to look at interest-based tribes and it's so much more important now than ever to, yes, we are shaping the culture of consumption, but you also need to participate in the culture that you want a part of in the first place, right? It's about looking at what are their interest-based tribes, what makes them tick, what bands them together as far as communities. It could be music-based, it could be sports-based, it could be travel-based, but you have to meet them where they are in that regard because otherwise you're always going to be on a different wavelength and not communicating with each other. I think going back to the craftsmanship example, what we've been able to do with um, elevating craftsmanship to a level of aspiration and luxury just from a brand positioning, it's the exact same craft, but putting it in a different space where we have all the biggest design masters in the world, Nicola Gueschia, Maria Grazia, John Galeno, working with traditional Chinese craft communities. You know, Chanel obviously has done a lot with um, African craft communities as well and putting it in a different framework so that you're meeting the consumer in their interest space as opposed to adding an extra thing that they have to then pay attention to later. Maybe just building on that, because I think that I love the idea of bringing joy and inspiration to the consumer. And there's a really good example of an organization that we've supported as a foundation that I think that's done that very well, yet highlighted the challenge of, say, the garment worker. And that's Fashion Revolution with the Who Made My Clothes campaign. And unlike many other kind of movements, it was very much around, we love our brands, we love fashion. You know, tell your favorite brand that you want to know who's the human behind the clothes that you love. You know, because we're all human. And it was a real, you know, very connecting campaign. Um, it went viral. We actually had garment workers in factories holding these signs saying, who made my clothes? I made your clothes. I mean, it was really a wonderful way to connect consumer with the folks way on the other side of the world that are making their clothes. I have one last question before opening up for taking questions from the floor. Fast fashion. When you think about overproduction, you think about fast fashion. How do you deal with that? Well, I would say from the production uh, point of view that the durability of the garment is very important. When, I, when the life of a garment is extended by just maybe three to six months, mm -hmm. statistics shows that five to 10% of carbon footprint is reduced. Mm -hmm. So I think design durability is very important in fast fashion. 
we are the opposite of fast fashion. Absolutely. Right, as I said earlier, <laughs> Ralph and the team's design products with the timelessness philosophy so that you can wear this jacket in 30 years and it, it will still look good. So, yeah, we're the opposite of fast fashion. Well, in a perfect world, in a circular fashion industry, as I said at the beginning, you can fashion endlessly and you would actually shift from <clears throat> owning to using. We're not there yet. Um, and the owning kind of dominance in the sector is what's causing all this waste. And you're seeing big brands, um, you know, with big pop-up stores in the U.S. that are just pushing volumes through. That's not sustainable. So I think that we need to, <coughs> we need to move. We know we need to move. But to do that, we also need to change the rules of the system. And even just in the last year, there's been at least a dozen elements of, of legislation coming out of the EU that will help lift the laggards and tackle some of those issues that are perpetuating that volume going through, including this week, the EU Parliament just actually passed the um, anti-greenwashing um, directive, mm -hmm. which will now go to the Council. So that's actually quite exciting because it's actually calling for more authentic uh, production, um, higher quality, and hopefully we'll eat away at this problem. I think with all of the regulation element and the production element, I do have to again bring it back to consumer psychology and fast fashion as a construct, how that uh, I would say trains or conditions a consumer to behave, right? I think a good analogy is, you know, Starbucks, you start with the frappuccinos <coughs> with a lot of whipped cream and you graduate them to a high margin black coffee product by the time they're 25. Um, but I think with fast fashion, you have to remember the purpose of fast fashion from a consumer standpoint at an early stage of the <coughs> consumer career is that it's a democratization of access to fashion from a creative standpoint, right? They want to participate in fashion as a form of expression. They're not necessarily at the stage of disposable income to be able to afford the slow fashion or luxury product. And it's a gateway entry for them to graduate to that stage. But at that stage of their consumption career, if they're conditioned to think, okay, it's a $39.99, I'm going to buy and dispose, buy and dispose. When they graduate to be able to afford a luxury product, it doesn't necessarily mean all of a sudden they're treating things differently. They might not be throwing away immediately because there's an inherent greater value in the product as far as brand equity, but they're still buying and disposing and buying and disposing. And so when it comes to the concept of fast fashion, I think we have to look more at how that influences consumers from a very early stage in their formative years of consumption behaviour formation, right? And so it's like, how do we look at that as a broader behavioural system and think about how, what is the value of things? How do we educate in a non-condescending way of the value on things? That I think is a more important question. Fascinating, and role models like Margaret, speaking to the young people is incredibly important. So with that, we'll open up to the floor. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question and briefly identify yourself. And any questions from the floor? Yes, this lady in the middle. So I have a question. And I uh, we have a mic. I have a question uh, to the forum here. By the way, I work with Fashion for Good. I'm one of the corporates that works with them. Um, the interesting thing that I must tell you, while uh, we are talking in pockets about fashion, imagine the kind of millions and billions of population that is there, and it is the compl complete supply chain you're talking about, the farmers to the plastics, to uh, the manufacturers, <coughs> to the contractors, and the countries that we're working with. I think we are, you know, we are sourcing from different countries in the world. I think the interesting thing and the strong word that's emerging <coughs> is collaboration. And I think the countries will need to collaborate with their policies that they have internally and externally to take this forward. Because um, even I work with farmers, I work with around 50,000 farmers in farming programs in India, in cotton. But again, the regen cotton, the regen farming is again a long way to go. It's going to take a long process. But I think it's all about policies and how countries take this as a very important way of uh, moving forward. So I think that's my... <clears throat> Uh, comment. Uh, you know, comment here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, is there a question attached? Uh, no, I think um, this is a good initiative. And I think for me, um, I've been talking to Suchitra here for plastic. And I think even for uh, circularity and to your, we were working with one of your startups, which was in America, which actually was at the retailer end, which was taking all the hard, you know, products and getting it back. Mm -hmm. But again, the supply chains tend to be very, very, uh, you know, crazy. And I want to understand how will this be resolved? Because while we're talking about a lot of things that are happening, but the entire supply chain is complex and disrupted. So yeah, that's my question as well. So, you know, 
my friend Dipali here, we've been talking about how <clears throat> they can use recycled fiber content in the products they make and supply to the Walmarts and the IKEAs of the world. But like I said earlier, that fiber, we need, bot we need collection, we need scale, we need infrastructure to collect the bottles back to make enough recycled fiber to provide converters like Dipali, Wellspun, so that we reduce our scope one scope to emission and the end consumer reduces their scope three. But we have to also be mindful in the policy making that there is not double counting of scope one, two, three emission. Mm. So I think the policy makers need to keep that in mind as well. Yeah. But it's all about collaboration at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and just building on that perhaps, um, Bachelor for Good just launched its next five year strategy and has five big bets. One of those five big bets is to focus on suppliers and provide more bespoke support to the supply chain. Because it started with market plus innovators equals scaled innovation, not necessarily. <laughs> so we need to focus more. That also means there, and as a foundation, there needs to be more support to the industry in the producing countries. Because as I mentioned legislation, if you see the, you know, the European Corporate Sustainability Directive, that's gonna have implications in each of these countries. That's not fully understood yet. So I think there's also a need on the policy side and with you know, catalytic capital to, to help the industry uh, step up to that as well. Thank you, any other questions on the floor? <clears throat> Hello, I'm an architect um, working with sustainable luxury waste for the design. And one of the problems we have, mostly with our clients, is they don't want recycled plastics to be used because of the nanoparticles that may rub into the skin or whatever. So I was wondering how you're handling recycled plastic textiles in terms of that same issue. Sure. Like the quality of the recycled plastic, a lot of it, ocean waste is very degraded already and so on. So there's a lot of uh, study going on on that. We at Indorama are not, com we don't have the competence to do the research on health-based regulations ourselves. But we do abide by what they have mandated. And safe packaging, safe wearability is something that we believe in and we always work towards. So we abide by the goals that have been provided by uh, the rules and regulations provided by the FDA and other authorities. Absolutely, and we'll always be in touch with the regulators mm -hmm. to make sure that we are doing the right thing and safe packaging is very important. Mm -hmm. That's sustainability for my industry. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Arnaud Pieton. I'm the CEO of Technip Energies, and we, uh, we're, we are an engineering and, and uh, you know, process chemical, uh, chemistry company, and we bring processes at scale, industrial scales and the rest. And our, our work is a molecule we created recently about partnerships and new partnerships, a company named Reju uh, with IBM and Under Armour. So with the aim of going from textile to textile recycling. Um, we're finding it's extremely, and, and our job is to bring small technologies at very large scale. We work with Carbios, we are basically taking their technology at scale, industrial scale, they work with us. And scale is necessary in order to uh, answer what I mean, you're facing at the moment. And there's a tipping point, and once we reach a tipping point, cost comes down, and it, it's great for everyone. So it's about reaching that tipping point where, you know, raising to the channels of the scale. My question is, I mean, for us, it's incredibly difficult. We're trying to create an ecosystem between collectors, sorters, and the piece we bring, which is the technology around uh, the textile to textile and cotton recycling as well. My question is about your ability to mandate in terms of the type of product that you want uh, as brands uh, to put into your uh, products. And consumers have to demand it. They need to be ready to pay for it. Nobody's going to forego profit for climate. We know that, so it has to be economical. But I'm wondering in terms of your um, you know, specification towards the providers, um, basically in our world as well, we mandate sometimes. We want low carbon products, we want low carbon steel, we want low carbon cement, and it's making its way into our specification now in the large infrastructure we, we build. So I'm just wondering how, you know, you have a role to play in mandating as well and asking for, uh, you know, a, a particular type of product. So I'm wondering whether this has found its way into your specifications and your request towards your, your suppliers, basically. How do you manage your suppliers? Basically? Yeah, listen, absolutely, and it's a great way to drive change, yeah? So. We mandate, we have very clear sustainability <coughs> mandates, whether that's how man waste is managed, use consumption of water, types of materials that are used. We also have social mandates, 
How are you paying your teams? How are you developing your talent? Are you, you know, your special program to drive women in leadership in our supply base? So those are, those are incredibly powerful tools that we have with very clear expectations. And if companies are not able to deliver against that, then they don't work in our ecosystem. I'll give you a recent example. This company, as of, as of now, we will not work with any supplier that has coal generated mm. energy. That's just a choice that, that we have made. I believe if all of us come together like this, we will, we will ultimately drive change. The other part of the, um, the ecosystem that's helping drive change is our wholesale partners, right? So take, uh, you know, I used to work for Procter & Gamble before. Walmart had very strict expectations. If you didn't meet those expectations, you weren't on their shelves. You want to be on Walmart's shelf. For us now in the fashion industry, we work with Zolando, for example, which I think is, is a real leader on the sustainability front. They have very clear expectations. If you don't meet, do not meet these expectations, you're not available on their website. I think the combination of the different elements within the supply chain, setting expectations on what's required, both on the environmental front and on the social front, is our key catalyst to drive change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're running out of time, but uh, I think in a short 45 minutes, we discussed a lot of important information. <coughs> we'll talk about the scalability and the tipping point, and most importantly, also how to bring the consumer along with the industry in this journey. So before I finish, imagine you're facing a room of 20-something-year-old, like Margaret described, and they are getting to buy their fast fashion or they are getting to buy their affordable Ralph Lauren that will keep for 20 years. What's the message you want to send to the 20 year old that, like Margaret said, in their formative age, to change their consumer behavior or to be a more responsible consumer? If you can tell them one sentence, start from Lucita. I mean, I'm just going to copy a quote from Vestia Collective, and uh, that is think first and buy second. Think first and buy second. Quality, investing in quality is the, the best thing you can do for yourself. That's a good catchphrase. And uh, Leslie? Can I take that too? <laughs> <laughs> no, and also, support local creators um, and find creative ways to find them. Mm, that's very powerful as well. And Margaret? I think the most important thing is to step out of cynicism. I think there's an inherent distrust of the younger generation of existing systems because they haven't necessarily served them in other ways. So I think what I would ask for, of them is for optimism, for participation, to buy less, buy more intentionally, and to think of a collective future together, right? And I think if you give them that goal of what are we working towards in a future state for their children, for their children's children, to give them that bigger picture, then at least they know what they're working towards as opposed to what coffee am I buying, what jacket am I buying, right? To give the bigger picture. So basically invite them yeah. to join the effort. Join us. <laughs> yeah. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause to our speakers.